everybody, how are we doing? Well, good. Some of you sound awesome today, and uh, I've had a chance to meet several of you. My name is John McLarnon, and I am a pastor in the area. I've been a part of a couple of different churches. Uh, we've lived here for 18 years, almost 19 years, and uh, just this year did I actually meet Pastor Matt, and I don't even remember how that happened, but we've struck up a pretty good friendship and he said, I can't find anybody to fill in for me so I can hang out with my family. You'll have to do. So he said, you come on over, talk to the people. We'll pick up the pieces when you're done and see what, uh, see what we can do with all that. But uh, I'll just say this, that um, uh, just my relationship with him this year will be one of my highlights of the year. So that's been a really great thing for me. And I hope that he would say the same thing. Um, when we get together, I just want you to know this, that when he and I get together and we have coffee or lunch or something, something like that, he always tells me how much he loves you and how much he loves this church. And he feels appreciated by you. He feels loved by you. But as a pastor, I'll just add this as well, just to say, keep loving on him and keep appreciating him and his family. And uh, I know that you pray for him, keep praying for him, and just let him know, hey, thank you for what you do, and uh, we support you. And so, hey, by being here today, I think it's a great statement. You guys love this church as well. So let's see what we can do this morning together. Um, I will admit on the front end, these, these are some ideas, and I told him I'm still kind of working through them. And he said, well, let's test them out on these people. Let's see what happens. So here we go. Let's start this way. Do you guys have a favorite chair that you sit in? Anybody have a favorite chair that you sit in? Uh, years ago, we, my wife and I, we got married when we were really young, and our son, we, we're in Walmart. He's just finally able to walk. We go down the kid's aisle, and he sees this chair, all right? It's a foam chair that looks like a bear, and he pulls it off the shelf, and he sits in it, and he will not leave the store until the bear chair comes with us, okay? And so this was his favorite chair for years. He sat in it until he finally, you know, it had to be condemned. We had to put it in the trash. We can't sit in this thing any longer. So I don't know. You got a favorite chair? Mine is a recliner. I got it the very first year that we were married, it's, uh, it's a, it's a low-end recliner, but listen, it, if we make it to Thursday, that'll be our 26th anniversary, okay? So you guys pray for us this week. Thursday, 26 years, and th I've ha I still have this chair. It sits out in our sunroom. When I'm in that room, when I'm reading, I sit there. When I'm having coffee, I sit there. When I'm doing some work, I sit there. When I go in that room, you got to get out of the chair. That's my chair, okay? That's where I sit. And so I would say, though, that my favorite chair is probably a beach chair. Anybody else? Okay. Hey, would you just take maybe 20 seconds, tell the person next to you, a little bit about your favorite chair. And I wonder if there was some, if somebody would help me do something real fast. It's just bothering me, sorry. All right, we good? Let's go. Um, maybe you don't have a favorite chair, and I know we got kids in here today. I'll try to, I'll try to keep it all G. All right, here we go. Um, maybe you don't have a favorite chair, but uh, you know what can happen if you have a bad seat. And when I was in second grade, we got some second graders in here maybe. All right, when I was in second grade, the girl in front of me was always bothering me, okay, just always bothering me. I could not pay attention, and I remember one day I just couldn't take it anymore, and the teacher could tell something was troubling me, and she came over, John, is there a problem? And I, I said, Julie won't stop kissing me, okay? Now, I didn't know that wasn't a problem when I was in second grade, but in second grade, that's a problem, right, when a girl's really bothering you. And so how many of you have had a bad seat at a sporting event? At a concert, you're sitting right behind this pole right now, okay? You've had, you've had a bad seat before. But we all know, hopefully, and this, I want you to really think about this, how being in the right chair can make all the difference in the world, all right? I, I am friends with a guy who's a national sports writer. He used to live here, um, actually in Pastor Matt's neighborhood, and we became really good friends. And he would cover sports for our three local colleges, primarily basketball. And he worked for the Charlotte paper at the time when we, we were really good friends. And he had spent a Thanksgiving weekend, uh, Thanksgiving week in New York at a basketball tournament covering one of our local teams. So he gets back into town and he says, hey, I'm really tired having been at this tournament all week. Duke is playing at home 
against Army tomorrow. Do you want to take my press pass and go to the game? Okay. Don't be fooled by the red sweater, okay? I have been a Duke fan my entire life, okay? And I started following them when I was in high school. Like, that's my team, and, and, and I want to go to Cameron. I want to see them play. And, and I had the privilege of being in there for a practice. But I, I, uh, definitely, I'm going to take your press pass, and I'm going to go up to the game. And so when I go to his house to pick it up, he says there's just one rule. You cannot, please do not go sit down on press row. Okay, so I, I get the parking pass. I drive right up to the front door of Cameron. I get out. I make my way to the building. I give a nod to the security guard like I've been here before, and I walk right in. I'm down on the floor. You know, the teams are warming up. I'm walking across the baseline under the basket. I'm headed. I see where all the guys are over there on the front row, and that's where I go, okay? I'm definitely going to go sit on press row because I want to be right there where the action is, okay? And so I'm walking by all these guys, and they're, they're already working on their computers. I've got nothing. I'm just walking in like this. I don't even have a piece of paper to make it look like I'm taking notes about anything at all. And, and this is 2000, 2001 when that team went on to win the championship, okay? And so I'm sitting here, I'm at this table, you know, and there, I could reach out and touch Shane Battier if I wanted to. I was that close. The students are leaning up against me, you know, they're like, breathe, I can feel them, they're touching me, they're breathing me. And then at halftime, I'm like, that, that was like the best experience of my life. And then I, all these guys get up and leave press row and they go that way. And I'm like, I wonder where they're going. I'm going to follow them. Well, they're going into the hospitality room, which is another no-no you're not supposed to do. So I go into the hospitality room. There's all kinds of food in there. I mean, there's TVs and guys are working on their stories already. And I'm just meeting people and acting like I'm supposed to be there. And I pick up a stat sheet. This guy's coming around. I take it back out. So I have some paper down at the front row, you know. It, it was just, here I am, right, with my favorite basketball team in my favorite arena, right, the year that these guys are going to go on and win the championship. I'm sitting courtside. I've got the Cameron Crazies. That, like, that might be the best seat that I've ever had, especially at a sporting event. And what's true, here's what I want you to think about. What's true about a sporting event and what's true about a concert and what's true about a classroom is true in spiritual terms too. And here's the deal, is that being in the right seat can make all the difference. All right, being in the right seat can make all the difference. And here's some ideas I've been thinking about lately. An author by the name of Bruce Wilkinson wrote a book called Experiencing a Spiritual Breakthrough in which he uses the analogy of three chairs, all right? And we'll just talk about these three chairs for the remainder of our time today. And what he's doing is to help us assess where we are in our relationship with God. And I pitched this idea to Matt, and I said, hey, being the last day of 2017, and tomorrow we're going to turn a page and enter a new year, maybe this will be a really good exercise for us all today to uh, just kind of do some assessment on where we've been and where we need to go. And so what I want to suggest today is that every person sits in one of these three chairs, all right? And we're just going to call them uh, one, two, and three, okay? One, two, and three. And we'll call this one the chair of commitment, all right? and, and if you're a note taker, I'm going to give you lots of buzzwords you can throw down today. But the chair of commitment in spiritual sense is, I know God, I love God, I have a relationship with God, I want Him to be the leader of my life, right? I want Him to, to call the shots and what He says goes, then I want to follow it. Like we have a love relationship. Th that right there is the chair of commitment, all right? And then chair two, you could call the chair of compromise, Right, the chair of compromise. Th this person has an association with Jesus, and sometimes I feel like it's going really great and we're tight, and other times I feel real distant from him. And it might be that I sat in this chair at one point in my life, but things faded, right? Maybe I signed up for something that later I thought, man, I don't know if that's what I really wanted to do or not, right? I may have been committed at one point, but I've fallen over to chair two, and I'm just kind of compromising. And then the last one would be the chair of complacency. And all kinds of people go in this chair. It, it could be an atheist. It could be an agnostic. It could be uh, someone who had been in another chair at another point in your life, but it no longer really means anything to you, right? You're, you're, you're fine getting along just by yourself over here in this chair, Co completely comfortable without any spiritual direction in, in their life. And I think every person sits in one of these three chairs. And that's extremely important because 
right? Being in the right chair makes all the difference. And so my goal at the end of the next few minutes together is that you'll know, right? You'll be able to say, oh, I know exactly where it is that I sit. And you'll be able to know what it takes to move to a different chair, okay? And so I want to just simply explore a concept in Scripture. If you're looking for me to expound a chapter of the Bible, you're going to have to come back next week. We're going to hit it real briefly, and we're going to spend the rest of our time just applying it, okay? And so I think you see these three chairs show up in the Old Testament story of Joshua. And we're getting ready to read from Joshua 24, but Joshua, right, he's leading the people of Israel. He's given his pregame speech, you know, to the whole nation of people right there before they enter the promised land. He's been a great leader, right? And it's right here towards the end of his life. He says this in Joshua 24, 14. He says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your forefathers worshiped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether that's the God your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now, Joshua, right, he's got a whole lifetime of experience with God. He's seen God work. He knows God personally, right? He's seen God intervene on behalf of himself and a whole nation of people, Joshua, I would say, is seated over here in chair one. He's got this chair one philosophy. Hey, we, me, my family, we're going to serve the Lord. That's the decision that we've made. And so Joshua is ready to release everybody. Hey, go take possession of the land. And when you pick up the story just a couple pages later in Judges chapter 2, you read this in Judges 2 verse 6. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites... They went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. Now, listen to verse 7. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Now, that doesn't sound too bad, except for these words I want you to, to think about, had seen and had done. And what I noticed there is that a gentle slide seems to have taken place for the people who, where Joshua is sitting in chair one, the people seem to be sitting in chair two, right? Joshua's over here. He's experiencing God. He knows God. The people in chair two seem to have been observing God in someone else's life, Joshua's, right? This is how quickly they're saying, look, now, it's what Joshua saw. It's what Joshua experienced that they were observing. This is how quickly things can change, by the way. Very next sentence, verse 8, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So now you got a whole generation of kids, right? Their parents they, they saw the walls of Jericho fall down. Their parents saw that happen. You got a generation of kids whose grandparents likely crossed through the Red Sea. They saw Pharaoh actually be defeated. And nobody seems to have said anything about it to their kids or their grandkids. Nobody was really living out the power of God's presence in their life so that this generation actually took notice of it. They, they seemed to know absolutely nothing about God. So the result, verse 11, then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. Right? Joshua, in chair one, experienced God personally. Others from afar, seated in chair two, are watching Joshua, right? but they didn't tell their kids about it. So you have kids seated over in chair three who actually grew up and didn't know anything about God at all. And just that quickly, right? One generation away, just that quickly, God's completely off the radar. Commitment, complacency, compromise, or compromise and complacency. So personal relationship with God, chair one, chair two, I know about God, chair three, never really heard much of anything. 
chair one, I know God and I serve God. Chair two, I've heard stories about God. Chair three, haven't heard much of anything, haven't really seen much of anything, don't really know Him. Are we clear on that? Because the rest of this is really application. In other words, what does that really look like when you play it out in the many different areas that we all live in? I mean, let's just play this out in a couple of different ways. Think about how this plays out in the most important arena, I would say, your relationship with God, right? Your relationship with God. In chair one, we would say God is clearly at the control center of a person's life, right? God's the, God's the leader. We would say in real church terms, God is seated on the throne of this person's life right here in chair number one. It's a relationship of love, right? We talk all the time. God's very much with me. When he speaks, I listen. I try to act because everything, right? My, my job, my finances, you know, work, relationships, everything comes back to him in the end. God, we would say in chair one, is involved in every part of our life. There's full integration there. I want to know him. I want to follow him. I want to serve him with everything I have. Christian author C.S. Lewis, like he said it this way, and this person in chair one, we go, yes, I agree with that. He said, one thing Christianity can never be is moderately important. That's chair one. Chair two relationship with God would say this, God and I are co-pilots of sorts, all right? We both take turns leading. God's a fine pilot until he does something that I don't like, and then I kind of come in and I take over from there, and then I'm going to do what I want to do. Chair two people are really good at compartmentalizing their faith, meaning if a chair two person is in a church, they're in a church. Like everybody goes, man, you're part of our church. We love it. And they, they blend in and they fit in really great, but they also fit in well at work and at school and on the softball team. Are, are you with me on that one? And maybe it wasn't always that way for this person, but somehow over time, what they once had starts to fade a little bit. Now, just think about church attendance, okay? It's only a small way to measure this kind of thing. But church attendance for somebody in chair two becomes just something that we do, right? Something we do if we don't have a lot of other conflicts, right? If I don't have a trip to the beach scheduled, if we don't have a tournament, if somebody doesn't have sports, if, if we're available and we're not tired and we're not living out an overly packed schedule that we created. By the way, all this is stuff I can say because we don't have relationship. You get that, right? It's not personal. It's not personal. It's just what I think. Now, this will shock some of us for sure, but there's legitimate research out there that says it is possible, and I'm just going to say possible, that a person can find themselves in chair two by simply missing a gathering like this 12 times in a year, okay? Okay? That people have actually done that research that you're going, okay, once a month. Oh, wow, that, that's not very much, right? Because what happens is it's that consistency of being here, that habit of being here correlates to other areas of life in terms of how we handle faith, how we manage spiritual habits. It's that consistency, and then faith gets pushed down a little bit. In many ways, chair two is, is a movable chair, all right? And what I mean by that is I kind of want a relationship with God, but I really rather put myself first sometimes. When we say, or when people say, you know, Christians are hypocrites, you know what they're talking about? They're, not, they're talking about people in chair two is what they're talking about. Now, if there's something that's great about this chair, and I'll say that, okay, if there's something that's great about this chair is that people seated in chair two always have the people in chair three to look at, okay, and go, oh, well, at least I'm not over there. But do you know what people in chair three are saying? They're saying, why would I want to live like that? Like, why would I want to do that in chair two? I'm just going to stay over here and be fully committed to it, okay? So, Chair one, God is on the throne. Chair two, God and I are co-pilots. Chair three, I don't really care that much about God. It's just me, okay? That's chair three over there. I'm going to have it my way. I'm going to enjoy my life. I'm going to be comfortable doing what it is that I want to do. In other words, if God is true, I'm willing to admit, and if God is real, that's just a chance I'm going to have to take. 
but I'm going to assume that he's not. And the problem with this particular chair over here is the longer you sit in it, the harder it is to get out of it. Now, that's relationship with God. Run this whole thing through the filter of how we view the Bible, okay? And let me just, if you're a note taker, I'll just give you some key words you can throw down on all this. But chair one, all right, the word is submit. So in chair one, people view the Bible and they go, oh, that's God's word. That's the authority for my life. What it says, I believe. I think it's true. It's going to guide how I make decisions in my life. The word is, I submit my life to it. The way people in chair two view the Bible is probably respect, right? It contains some really good ideas. There's some great lessons in there. It's slightly more reputable than Dr. Phil. We could add that, right? But honestly, it's, it's kind of an old document that doesn't always understand my life. It's helpful, but maybe not necessary uh, to be a guiding force for everyone all the time. The Bible, we would say in chair two, I respect it, okay? In chair three, people look at the Bible and say, I own one, okay? <laughs> I own one. It's got a family tree in the front, right? Somebody filled out some names and people got married and there were kids. But it was written by a bunch of old guys who really have no clue what's happening in 2017. All right, that's the Bible. Run this through the filter of work. People in chair number one go, my job is a calling. That's a calling. God has led me to this position. I embrace it not just as a way to make money and pay bills, but it's a calling, right? Whatever it is I'm doing, I'm working at it as an undercover minister. It's a calling for me, right? I'm working at it with the best of what I have and what I can give and what I can bring to it. Chair two people typically look at their job as a blessing, but not necessarily from God per se, but it might be this, thank you, God, that I even have a job, right? It's that, it's that kind of view. I don't see it as anything more than it's just work that I do. Uh, chair three say my job is an opportunity, and the opportunity is for me to further myself. So whatever I need to do to get ahead, I will use this job, this position, these people to make that happen. It's going to get personal, but remember, it's not because it's personal. We don't know each other. Think about this through the filter of marriage, okay? And we'll get to kids in a second in parenting. Chair one people view marriage as a covenant, right? That's the word, covenant. Like, what we have is the real deal. It, it's a covenant, right? It, husband and a wife, and we're going to do this no matter how hard it is, no matter what it takes, no matter what amount of work or effort we have to put into it. We're going to make this thing work till the end, right? It, it's a covenant. And we're going to do whatever we have to do to keep it together because, and here's the because, because our relationship is telling a much greater story. And the story that we're telling as a husband and a wife is the story of Jesus and the church, so it's, it's a covenant. Chair two people will view marriage as a contract. Okay, a contract. I'll do my part, and you do your part, and everything will be fine. And if you don't keep up your end of the bargain, then all bets could potentially be off, right? If you stop making me happy, it, then I might feel that I need a way out. I reserve the right to at least do that. It's, it's contractual. <laughs> Chair three people will view marriage as a convenience. Uh, our society says it's respectable. You have to do it, okay? You got to go through with that, if you, you know, the ceremony and all that. And maybe, maybe this is just a reality. Maybe we already have kids together. Maybe we can get a tax break. Marriage becomes a convenience, all right? Covenant, contract, convenience. All right, we got kids in the room, so let's talk about parenting. Are we ready When you run the filter on parenting and kids through these three chairs, and again, a lot of these things I'm still, I'm still wrestling with, okay? Chair one, parents want to raise godly kids. I want to raise godly kids so that honoring God is the highest value that we pass on to them. 
which means I, I did youth ministry for years, and this was constantly a struggle where a kid goes away to a week at camp, he goes on a mission trip, he comes back, he's so excited, he's so fired up, he wants to commit his life to serving Jesus, but a parent is over here going, I don't know if you can make any money doing that. I don't know if that's a good idea. Chair one parents are committed to raising godly kids, which means if a child comes to you and says, you know what, I'm thinking about being a missionary in Africa, that parent goes go for it. If that's what you think God wants you to do, let me help you make that happen. People here in chair one parent with confidence, okay? We parent with confidence. Chair two parenting can look like this. We want to raise good kids. That, that's a decent goal. I want to raise good kids, right? They need good moral lessons. They need manners, but we don't want them to get too Jesus weird in the end, okay? Don't get into too much trouble, don't embarrass me, get out alive, and, and then you can go on with your life. Uh, chair two parents parent with a lot of hope, right? I hope it works out for you. <laughs> All right, chair three parents want to raise successful kids. You need a good education. You got to meet the right people. You got to go to the right schools. You got to get a good job so you can make good money. And we will ignore biblical principles and let you choose your own way. And if we should have a student of the month, then that might make me parent of the month, right? That's the way we view that. People here, okay, and this is where it hurts, people in chair three parent with a lot of confusion, a lot of confusion. And here's what the research actually shows, okay, that not 100%, but pretty close, typically, that first chair parents will raise first chair kids. Second chair parents don't raise second chair kids, they raise third chair kids. And you might say, well, well, why is that? Well, here's why. Because when kids who are looking to their parents for direction, for purpose, values, see a lack of consistency, or they detect some presence of hypocrisy, they see that conflict and they run away from it. They see parents, right, sitting in chair two, and they're not fooled by the priorities that don't seem to match up. You, you guys understand this. Some of you do because it's why some of you went away to college or you got out on your own, right? And there comes a time when God or faith, your, your biblical values conflicted with something that you wanted to do. And you turned away from it. Like that's your experience. That's your story. And that's my story, right? Right? And, and there was a conflict, and I didn't have anything to look at, and so I did what I wanted to do. L let me give you a real example from the Old Testament, okay? David, little boy David, shepherd boy David, David and Goliath, David and Bathsheba, King David, greatest king of all. David, I would say, is a chair one guy. He made some bad decisions in his life, okay? We definitely know that. But he is the greatest king in Israel, and it was said of him at the end of his lifetime, you know this one? He was a man after God's own heart, right? His son Solomon, I would say, actually grew up in chair two, and a lot of that happened when David made bad decisions. He started out pretty well in his life. God gave him some wisdom, right, to rule as a king, the wisest man who ever lived, but one thing God told him to avoid, maybe you know this one, hey, don't get involved with women who don't serve God. Guys, I think that's still great advice for you today, okay? Don't get involved with women who don't serve God. And he failed big time on that one. The guy had 300 wives. I can barely manage one. Are you guys with me? Three, 300 wives, and then he had 700 girlfriends on top of that. They drove him away from God to relying on himself. So he kind of played both sides. His son was a guy by the name of Rehoboam. Okay, Rehoboam, a chair three guy, I would say. Now, he, he was able to watch a little bit of his grandfather, David, but he learned most of his things in life from his father, Solomon. Now, Rehoboam, he rejected all kinds of godly advice in his life. He actually pulled together a group of friends who would tell him whatever he wanted to hear, a bunch of yes men, and he became essentially the worst king of Israel so that the summary of his reign, when you read in the Bible, was that everyone did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I grew up for most of my life with two first-chair parents. 
My wife grew up most of her life with two first chair parents. That simple fact alone has profoundly affected not only our lives, but the lives of our kids. Because where you sit, right, and being in the right chair, it, it makes all the difference in the world. So here's the big questions I want to ask of you today. And I'm going to move to wrap this up. So you take a deep breath. Here we go. The big questions are today very simple. Where do you find yourself sitting? As we run through all these filters and we talk about what they mean, where, where do you find yourself sitting? And, and the bigger question for me is, what are you going to do about it? Right? What are we going to do about it? Because being in the right chair makes all the difference. And here's the great thing. You get to choose where you sit. You get to choose that. So if you're sitting in chair one, here's what I think you need to do today, okay? Your word is reaffirm, all right? Reaffirm. Reaffirm your commitment to Jesus Christ. You're like, okay, I got it. I'm in chair one. You identified it. That's what I want to be true about my life. You just reaffirm that. In a prayer here in a minute, just where you're seated, God, I, I reaffirm that. I, I'm going to make the choice to pick up the cross daily. I'm going to make the choice to follow you closely. I'm going to constantly be assessing right, where I am. Okay, God, where do I sit today? And reaffirm. The words of, uh, of Joshua would be great words for you to say today. God, I reaffirm today. As for me, for my house, for my family, we're going to serve the Lord. If I find myself moving over closer to chair two over there and kind of sliding over, and that may happen at time, then I'm going to realign my life and get right back into chair one. And we're just going to say today, you know what? That's my chair right there, and I'm going to sit in it. I'm not going to move out of it. You, you just reaffirm that today. If you're in chair two, I think the word is repent. Okay, I think the word's repent. Repent, in other words, just turning your life around and turning fully to God, fully. This, this is without a doubt the most dangerous seat to, to be sitting in, okay? It's the most dangerous seat to be sitting in because it's easy to take comfort in believing in God and believing certain things about God, right? I, I'm comfortable with that. I believe Him. I kind of believe certain things about Him. But listen, Jesus is really the one who taught most of His life and ministry about it takes more than believing. It actually takes action. Right? You're going to show up, Jesus said, at the end of your life and say, Lord, I'm here. And He's going to say, uh, and you are? <laughs> because it takes commitment to get up every day and live in chair one. Now, it reminds me of a poem I heard a while back. Please hang with me. Kids, I'm going to say a word. Do not repeat this word. Okay. <laughs> I'm giving you, I'll tell you when it's coming. Okay. Listen to this. And this describes people in chair two. One night I had a wondrous dream. One set of footprints there was seen. Have you guys heard this one before? I don't think you have. Okay. One night I had a wondrous dream, one set of footprints there was seen, the footprints of my precious Lord, but mine were not along the shore. But then some stranger prince appeared, and I asked the Lord, what have we here? Those prints are large and round and neat, but Lord, they're too big for feet. My child, he said in somber tones, for miles I carried you alone. I challenged you to walk in faith, but you refused and made me wait. You disobeyed, you would not grow the walk of faith you would not know. So I got tired. I, I got fed up. All right. And there I dropped you on your butt. Because in life, there comes a time when one must fight and one must climb, when one must rise and take a stand or leave their butt prints in the sand. I told you you hadn't heard that one before. Okay. All right, kids, don't say butt. All right. What that means when I was reading that the other day was, seated in chair two, it's like, I, I, I really want to do both. I want to like, have a hand over here saying, I know God and I know things about God, but I'm really over here as well going, I just want to be the leader of my own life. And there comes a point where God says, do it. And he just kind of drops you down, and sometimes he might drag you along for a while, but there's going to come a point in time where he says, choose. Like, choose a seat. Choose a seat. I'm not going to drag you around forever. 
choose a seat. And that's what I would just challenge you to do today. Like if you say, okay, I, und- I think I probably identify with chair two, the word is repent. And that means I'm going to stop walking this direction and I'm going to turn around and walk that direction. And I'm going to make the move from two over to one. The majority of people, I can tell you this from experience, I've been in church my whole life and I've been a pastor for 20, almost six years. The majority of people filling up churches are living in chair two. We could even call it the wide chair if you want to. And Jesus gave that warning in Revelation chapter three, right? He said, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're neither. And it makes me ill, right? That's Jesus speaking. Modern translation, I think, I'd rather have you seated in chair number three than sitting in chair number two. Because if you're sitting there, you just make me want to throw up. In other words, quit trying to play both sides. Quit trying to sit in the middle. Now, the choice for you today is not to say, eh, okay, let me think about it, all right? The choice is this. Get hot and move to chair one and serve God. Connect with other people, right? Reignite your relationship with Jesus. But, and Matt can pick up these pieces later. I'll tell you what I think. If you don't want to move to chair one, then move to chair three. Just pick one, but don't sit in the middle. I mean, go all the way to chair three then and just say, you know what, I'm just going to go completely cold, and I choose that one. Nobody ever drifts from two to one. Just choose to go to three. I hope you'll go to one, right? And that's it. Repent. So here we go. Chair three. Your words receive, right? Receive. Receive choose, right? You choose today to let Jesus be the Lord, the leader, the Savior of your life. You choose to love Him. You choose to serve Him. You choose to follow Him. You choose to receive the gift that He offers to each and every one of us of salvation, of relationship with God, to be restored into that, to have a heavenly Father. I mean, chair three is probably nice and comfortable, but it comes with lots of questions that can't be answered, doesn't it? Questions about purpose and questions about meaning and questions about significance. But today's the day to move, right? You got to make that move. Now, the temptation for people sometimes is to go, okay, well, maybe I'll move from chair three over to chair number two. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't move from three to two. Two's the worst chair, right? Two's the worst one. Don't move from three to two. You got to go all the way from three over to one. And today, right, today is the day. This is why I think this is so great for us to be doing on December 31st is to say you don't have to turn a calendar page and wonder, did I choose the right chair? You're here today. You guys did it. You came on a holiday weekend. You came to church. Then you're here. And don't give up that moment, that opportunity to say, wow, on December the 31st of 2017, I chose the right chair. I chose the right one. So go from three all the way over to one. So that's it. Those are my thoughts. Where are you sitting? Right, where are you sitting? And what are you going to do about it? Because being in the right chair, in my opinion, makes all the difference. For me, today, I'm going to go have lunch with my family. We'll reaffirm this as we sit around the table. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I hope that's what you guys will choose today, too. Let me pray for you. I know the band is going to come and play. They're going to lead us. You always have the opportunity to come and pray today. I hope you'll take advantage of that. I'll hang out on the front row. If there's anything you want to talk about, just come tap me on the shoulder. Lord, thank you so much for today, the opportunity just to uh, look at some of your words in Scripture. God, I pray that we have been truthful to what you would have us to learn today, that we haven't said more or less than you communicate in the Scriptures. God, I pray for those in our room today who are in one. I thank you for them. I thank you that they're seated there. I thank you that uh, maybe they had a godly heritage that passed faith onto them. God, I'm thankful that they chose and are choosing to be people who love you, know you, and want to follow you. God, I pray for those in two and three, chairs two and three, that today, God, we would just make the choice God, we'd run the scenarios. We'd play it out. We'd look to see that you offer the best way possible to live. And we'd commit to follow you, to love you, to serve you. So God, I pray as we 
uh, sing today as we just uh, give you a few moments of prayer, that we'd be open, we'd be honest. God, we'd show courage to make the move, to be people who want to serve you. And we pray all this through Jesus. Amen.